So we're going to continue with the uh, components of uh, the optical instrument. So we're going to have optical sources, transducers, and measurement systems. Okay. Uh, so the notes that I have today is a combination of the Ingle book and some other sources, which I think is more uh, updated okay, to the book that we have. Okay, so last time, if you can uh, remember, we discussed about monochromators, filters, okay, but if we're going to look at the components that we have, the one that we have discussed so far are just these parts. Okay, so we're going to discuss this, this, and the other part, maybe not uh, all of them tonight, but that's the, uh, we could say, goal okay, for the next uh, several meetings. But the thing is we're going to have a change in the way we're going to do this thing because my main goal is for you to force to read the book. And I was able to get the notes, how I was able to do it for the last two years, okay, because I lost my notes. Everything was in the canvas. And, you know, starting last semester, uh, we lost canvas in Los Baños. So I found my old notes by looking at some of my uh, materials uh, earlier in the office. And I found out that the students were forced to read the materials because the quiz was given based on the materials without me lecturing it. So the way that I did it, if you look at the YouTube videos, there are some, there are only seven recordings from the original class. And now I realize why it is like that. Because the way I ask them to do is read the book, to force them to read the book, I'm going to give a quiz from the materials in the book. And we also have a quiz every time we have this because the material that we have here is the more updated one. Okay, so tonight we're going to look at these different uh, components of the optical instrument okay so as you could see everything that we have discussed so far is just here the wavelength selector the wavelength selector the wavelength selector okay the wavelength selector but we didn't discuss the other uh what we call component yet okay so what we're trying to do is at least discuss these uh, other components that we have. Because if you're going to look at the different components of these uh, different instruments or various types of instruments, they are always the same, okay? They are always the same in terms of the parts. The only one that makes them different has something to do with what? The arrangement that they have. If you're going to look at this, so in absorption, so you have what? One, two, three, four, five. And then in the fluorescence, look at the difference. You still have the source. And then there's a wavelength elect detector, then the sample. So the same thing with the absorbent, this uh, wavelength detector, and then the sample. And then we have the wavelength de uh, detect selector. So this one is what we call the what? Excitation wavelength. And this one is what we call the emission wavelength. Okay, so you could see the configuration is either an L shape. Sometimes you can put on the other side there another wavelength selector and detector. So you have there a configuration of the T shape. Okay, so I uh, experienced both using the L shape and the T shape. Okay. And there's a reason why the configuration is like this, not unlike this one. Okay, because if you're going to do everything in the straight line, what will happen if you're going to do it here? This is a wavelength selector and that's a detector. You're going to burn your detector because the source that you have will just go straight okay, to the wavelength selector. So you try to monitor the fluorescence from a 90 degree 
angle. Okay. Now, if you have what we call emission, so you can see here, there's a source, there's a sample, okay, and then you have the wavelength selector, and then you have what we call the detector. So all of them has just been like that. And in addition to this, okay, so based on the table here, this is just, we could say, the materials that you use to put your sample. So it could be your lithium chloride, your quartz, your glass, okay, a silicate glass, and then you have here the so-called salt glass. So the way that you use this one, if you have LIF, that is useful for uh, the IR region. Okay, the quartz has something to do with what? The UV dish region. The glass, some part of the UV, but mostly the visible. Plastic is just what uh, we can say a very narrow window. Now, NACL, you can use it from UV to, we could say, IR. But what's the problem with NACL? Anyone? Why do you think there's a limitation on the use of NACL? So if you have an AQ solution, what will happen is it will dissolve your NACL glass. Now the KBR, where do you use the KBR? So when you pelletize, you're doing the IR, you, you press it, you mix it with the KBR. Okay. Now in some other, they, they use tellurium bromide or tellurium iodide and some is in zinc selenide. But the one that I use usually for an IR window, that is much better, let's say, than NACL is silver chloride. Okay. Now, you can also look at the uh, materials that made up the wavelength selector. So you have here a chloride prism. So these are just the one that we have discussed before. So if it's in the vacuum uh, region, you have the fluoride uh, prism and then the fused silica quartz prism okay, is from the UBB going to near IR. The same thing with the glass prism. Okay. Now the NACL prism, you use it in the IR region okay, and some of the KBR prism. And then you see the gratings. It can range from the vacuum going to the far IR. And you can use some filters here. So this uh, glass filters that we have, so these are continuous here. So this one, this continuous, the glass filter that we have here, usually that's the one that we use, let's say, to protect your eyes from later light. Okay. So the one that we're going to discuss is this one as we go on. How uh, they are used at different, what we call wavelength, continuum and uh, time, and then later on, on what we call the detector okay so that's uh we could say the objective of, of this what we call discussion so maybe we can look at as early as when we call the black body radiation so maybe uh you were introduced to this i don't know but during my time this is during the so-called uh, chem 17 or gen chem 2 When you talk this what? Dual nature of light. Okay? But if you're going to look at the history of this, uh, we could say, black body radiation, we could say it's not really just all about what? Planck? Okay? Because uh, the way that we do, we could, uh, Planck was given the credit because he's the one who was able to explain it. But if you're going to look at this, we have to uh, first, we could say, discuss what is a black body. Okay. Uh, do you still recall the lecture that you had before?
So usually they, they said what? All objects would emit electromagnetic radiation according to their temperature. So they said the color, uh, the colder objects they emit waves with very low frequency, such as radio and microwaves, while hot objects emit visible light or even ultraviolet. Okay. Uh, these are what we call the shorter wavelength or the one that has the higher frequency. Now, how do they define black body during that time? Anyone? How do they define the black body during that time? Anyone? Any definition nila sa black body? I, 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 I remember uh, during that time, one of our classmates called uh, the P623 teacher as uh, Mr. Black Body Radiation. <laughs> but what do you call a black body? Black body is what? It's an idealized, we could say, physical body that absorbs all incident electromagnetic radiation regardless of the frequency okay or uh, we could say angle of incident so yun tinatawag nilang uh, black body okay so what they have observed uh, with this uh, black body radiation uh, in the early uh, in the 18th century so there's what we call the Kirchhoff and Stefan, Gustav Kirchhoff, and uh, what we call Joseph Stefan. Okay. They observed, okay, they, they made observations related to the thermal radiation emitted by the heated object. So they noted that the intensity and the spectral distribution of the radiation depended on the temperature. Of the object. And then in 1893, Wilhelm Gen, okay, uh, proposed like an empirical relationship between uh, the temperature of a black body and the wavelength at which it emits the maximum intensity of the radiation. Okay, so this is uh, what we call the Wilhelm's displacement law. Now, if you read the book, uh, it mentioned there about uh, uh, Wien uh, explanation, okay, on this what we call the black body radiation. So usually, what's the problem with the black body radiation? The, the, the classical physics that we know during that time, they cannot explain the spectral distribution of the black body, okay? What is the physics that exists during that time? Ano yung physics ng time na yun? Yung classical physics. Ano bang tawag dun sa classical physics? Okay. The physics by Newton. So, they cannot explain the behavior, okay, or the spectral distribution of the black body radiation. So we propose an expression that fits the observed spectral distribution fairly well at short wavelengths, but it failed at the long wavelength. Okay? So the, the outcome that they have there is what? The Wien's displacement law. So we could say this law uh, was derived based on the empirical observation and a lack of theoretical foundation. So, na-explain niya sa short wavelength, pero hindi niya na-explain at longer wavelength. And then in 1900, okay, uh, Lord Riley and Sir James Jean, they independently attempt to derive the spectral distribution of the black body radiation based on the classical electromagnetic theory. Okay? So, they propose an equation that is named after them, uh, Rayleigh Jean. 
equation. And this equation, okay, describe the intensity of radiation as a function of wavelength and temperature. So what they, uh, they, they tried to do there is they were able to match the observed data, but only in a very long wavelength. So if Yen was able to what we called uh, explain it in the shorter wavelength, okay, Rayleigh engines were able to explain it in the longer wavelength. So if you are a scientist, what do you do? Okay. You try to match, okay, what it is that match them in the long wavelength, longer wavelength, and what it is that match them in the shorter wavelength. Okay? So the, the Rayleigh genes law, it fails to accurately predict the observed behavior of the black body radiation at the shorter wavelength. And they call it what? Because it is a, what we call shorter wavelength, the UV catastrophe. So this one, okay with the shorter, this one, okay with the longer, okay? So what did Planck did? So what Max Planck did is introduce a revolutionary idea to address the shortcomings of classical physics in explaining the black body radiation. He proposed that the energy emitted or absorbed by a black body is what? An internal in done. Okay. So in doing that, 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 that we could say is a revolutionary idea. So what, 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 what the, the success that we have there is he was able to fit the spectral distribution of the black body radiation through uh, to be a turning point in the history of physics, for it eventually leads to what? The quantum physics, okay? So what the Planck's model do is assume that the walls of the oven were in terms of equilibrium with the radiation field inside. And he assumed furthermore that the atoms inside behave as oscillators absorbing and emitting radiant energy, okay? so. He explained it in terms of what this oscillator thing. So he assumed furthermore that the atoms and uh, the atoms inside behave as oscillators absorbing and emitting radiant energy. So all of these oscillators were possible in the Planck's model and a continuum distribution was predicted in the spectrum. So Planck's final assumption was that each atomic oscillator could absorb or emit only discrete amounts of energy directly related to the oscillation frequency. And this leads to the so-called Planck law. Okay? So, his hypothesis during the time suggests that electromagnetic radiation is emitted or absorbed in discrete packets of energy known later as what? Okay. It was called later as photons by Albert Einstein. So from this quantum hypothesis, Planck derived an equation that accurately describes the spectral distribution of the black body radiation. And they call it what? The Planck's radiation law. Okay. And it laid the theoretical foundation for black body radiation and successfully predicted the observed behavior across a wide range of wavelengths and frequency. So Planck's law marked a significant departure from the classical physics and it laid the groundwork for the so-called development of quantum mechanics. And what did Max Planck got uh, for this? Almost all. Okay, the research institute in Germany is named after him, the Max Planck Institute for whatever field in science. That is the one that is named. So the way that you put it here, so if you have, 
let's say the way that they explain it before in terms of the object they use like stars so if you have a red star this is the uh what we call spectral radiance that they get if you have a green star or a blue star and they, they try to compare it like in, in the lump okay uh atomic lump and to prove that this hypothesis is right they they did some experimental uh, we could say verification on this one. Scientists like Loomer and Pringsham, they conducted precise measurement of the black body radiation and they confirmed Planck's theoretical prediction. And this uh, results provided further support on the quantum nature of the radiation. So the way that uh, what we call Max Planck able to lay this foundation he was able to see that there are uh, different physics that govern the big objects like the planet, that's usually the classical, and the subatomic particle. Okay, so we could say it's really a revolutionary during that time. And if you have what we call the black body radiator, as I told you, all incident radiation is what we could absorb. absorb during uh, that time. So if you have a black body radiation, okay, or black body, what can you say about white body? So if the black body reflect uh, i mean absorb everything okay the white body on the other hand would reflect all incident radiation it doesn't absorb any of it so if it doesn't absorb then it neither emits nor absorbs radiation making it essentially what inert in terms of energy exchange okay and what is the one that is in between So if you have a black and then a white, when you combine them, you get what? The so-called gray body. Okay. Now, this, uh, we could say black body radiation that, that, that we have. If you're going to look at this thing, okay, so the way that we explain everything. With an ideal black body, absorption exactly balances the emission. So since absorption uh, occurs at the same rate as emission, the black body must contain an equilibrium density of radiation. And they usually call this the spectral energy density of a black body radiator, which is expresses this one, okay? So if you're going to, to, to look at this, this is just what? This is just based on the Planck uh, radiation law. Okay, so where they, they try to what we call describe it in terms of the so-called spectral radiance. Okay, so the assumption that we have there is in terms of this, what we call oscillator. So the simplified version that we have is just H and B, H times B, where the energy is a whole number of H times B. So maybe two times H B, three times H B, some sort of, that, that is what we call the Planck's law. So Planck's law, we could say, uh, accurately describes the observed black body radiation spectrum across temperatures and wavelengths. So at low temperature, okay, the radiation spectrum peaks at longer wavelengths, infrared region, uh, while at higher temperature, it shifts towards the shorter wavelengths. 
And this law also explains phenomena like wind displacement law, which describes how the peak wavelength of the black body uh, spectrum shifts inversely with the temperature. Now, yes, you could see all you remember is what? Max Planck. But uh, based on our discussion before, there are other people who work okay, on this problem on uh, black body radiation. Ang alam lang natin si Max Planck. Okay? So, just getting some information that we have there from the book. So, we could say here, uh, energy density is really difficult to measure. Usually work in region. So, instead of using energy density, we can just describe this as spectral region. Okay? So, if you're going to look at this uh, spectral region, it describes how much radiant energy or radiant power is emitted or received by a surface per unit area, solid angle and wavelength. Okay? So Planck deduced the black body equation after consideration of the thermodynamics of system with discrete energy level or multiples of Hb. So this is uh, the way that it is. Okay? But we simplify everything as just like this one. As I promise you, I'm not going to go with the calculation. I try to simplify the, the, the discussion that we have. Okay? And if you're going to look at this, what we call spectral radiance uh, of a black body as a function of wavelength for several in uh, temp temperature, this is what you see. So not the wavelength shift to the blue and the increase in the spectral uh, Regions as the temperature increases, so it goes the blue ship, as we call it. Okay, I, I I think I'll try to see if I can show you the animation of the black body radiation. So to see that. So this they use uh, when they're trying to monitor that one in terms of the star. So the red star, the white, uh, the yellow star, and the blue star. So this is also one application, or we could say, one proof on the dual nature of light, because the black body radiation was only able to we could say explain because of the concept that the light is a particle, okay? The, the main reason it was not able to be explained during that time is they think that the light behaves like a wavelength or a wave. That's why they were not able to do this thing. Now, as I have told you, Albert Einstein borrowed the concept of uh, Max Planck. So usually, if you're going to remember uh, Einstein, okay, what's the reason why he got the Nobel Prize? You still remember that? What phenomena was that wherein he used the concept of Max Planck that energy is quantized to explain this phenomena. Anyone? This is gen chem stuff. Ano yun? Concept na yun? The one that is got the Nobel Prize. You remember that? 
the photoelectric effect. Okay? So the photoelectric effect is just the ejection of the electron of the metal in the surface. So what he did, he applied he applied the concept and he called it photons that uh, electron can only be ejected if the minimum energy was achieved. Okay. So what happened is Einstein introduce this three probability coefficient. Okay, so we have the A, uh, B, and second B. So if you're going to look at this, this is what? Uh, A, J, I, B, J, I, and then B, I, J. So it just has something to do with this and this. Okay, transitions between two levels. So if it's A from J going to I, that's a spontaneous emission. Okay, but if it's B, uh, J I, it is from J to I, is a stimulated emission. So both of them, from higher to lower, are what we call the emission. Okay, so what's the difference between the two? Anyone? So the first one, we could say that's just absorption. So in the absorption, what happened? So energy, okay, was put into the system and it results for the system to go from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. Now, for the spontaneous emission, what happened? So there's an atom in level J, they can decay, uh, decay to level I by emitting a, uh, an amount of energy or a photon of energy as they uh, as we call it. And if the transition is spontaneous, not induced by the radiation field, that's the spontaneous emission. Now, how is it different from the stimulated emission? Or the other term that they have here is the induced emission. So what happened there, an atom at the level J, they can interact with the radiation field of the frequency Vij, and the transition from level J to level I can be stimulated. And this uh, what we call stimulated emission or induced emission is the same as the same frequency, or, or it's of the same frequency and phase as the radiation field. Okay, so more or less, this is already the principle that we have in optical spectroscopy, the absorption and the emission. So the transition probability for absorption is B, I, J, A, that for spontaneous emission is AIJ, and that for simulated emission is BIJ. And if you're going to look at this for this simple uh, two level, an atom initially in level I can interact with a radiation field of frequency we are absorbing the required energy and undergoing a transition to a level J. So this is, we could say, the absorption. So this is the one that we have. And the rate of the absorption per unit volume depends on the number of atoms in the initial state, the probability that it will absorb from state I to higher energy uh, state J, or the spect and the spectral energy density of the radiation. Okay. And how does this black body uh, can be applied? to what we call the spectroscopy. So if, we, if you're going to recall, the, the, the black body uh, that leads to the Planck flow, okay, it provides an expression for the spectral region, 
Oh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Oh, black body radiation at a given temperature. So it, it, it just say the, the equation of the Planck law that the spectral radiance is proportional to the ratio of the power emitted by a black body at the wavelength to the area solid and wavelength ratio. So you can use this black body radiation to characterize and compare the real radiation source. And you can use it to describe the broad spectral distribution from continuous sources or the continuum distribution from sources such as the high pressure arc lump. And Planck law can also be used to describe the emission and subabsorption of atoms in flames under thermal equilibrium condition. Okay? So remember, in spectroscopy, spectral region is essential for analyzing the emission and absorption spectra of the substances. So usually the spectral uh, regions, you measure it what? In terms of the light source or a sample, so they can identify uh, the composition, the temperature, and other properties of the source or the material. And these spectral regions, they can also help in calibrating the spectroscopic in this, uh, instrument and understand the behavior of the light matter interaction. So we could say uh, it doesn't only revolutionize the revolutionize the idea, but it also revolutionized this what we call uh, instrumentation that you have. Okay, so we could say the black body radiation serve as a fundamental concept and reference standard spectroscopy enabling precise measurement, uh, temperature determination, and the analysis of a wide range of material and phenomena across various scientific disciplines. Okay, so you can, what we could look at this, what we could, in terms of these uh, gray bodies, you can modify your, uh, what we could plant constant and you give it to this one. So this sort of shows imperfect absorption. Say a great body does not absorb all radiation incident to it. But the thing that we're going to look at is some of the important source uh, characteristics. Okay. So if you're going to look at this table, so in all optical instrument absorption, emission, scattering, luminescence, you always have what? A radiation source. Okay. So if you're going to look at the source spectral uh, characteristic, the wave range, the radiant flux, all of this what we call parameters. So we could say, okay, uh, this table here showed you the characteristic that most often considered when selecting a source for spectroscopic application. Okay, so if you're going to look at here, uh, spectral output, it can be what? Continuum, line, continuum plus line, the wavelength region, there's a UV region, a visible region, an IR, a microwave region, temporal behavior, it can be continuous, pulse, sine wave, or coherent. Okay. Uh, in terms of radiant spectral uh, radiant stability, long term, short term, warm up time, lifetime, operating life or shelf life, area of emission, the point source, extended source, special uh, behavior, you have what we call coherent. Okay. And that leads us to this what we call sources of radiation. So in order for us to have the suitable uh, spectroscopic uh, instrument, we need a source, a light source, okay? So what's the light source do? It must generate a beam of radiation with sufficient power for easy detection and measurement. And an output power should be stable for reasonable period. So I think 
everyone will say or will agree with me that for spectroscopic uh, instrument to work on, the first thing that you need is what we call the light source or the so-called source of radiation. Okay? So for a suitable spectroscopic study, a source must generate a beam uh, with sufficient region power for easy detection and measurement. And in addition, its output power should be stable for reasonable periods of time. That's why what the first thing that you do if you want to use, let's say, a spectrophotometer, what do you do? Ano yung ginagawa niyo? Di ba usually nag-ano tayo? Tawag dito? Warm up? Am I right? Pag nag-run ba kayo ng instrument, pag on nyo, run agad? Think about it. Whenever you run an instrument, okay, you always have to warm them up. Okay. Because as much as possible, you want them to have a stable input and output. Okay. So that brings us to this what we call two sources of the or two types of the so called uh, radiation sources. We have the continuum sources and the line sources. So if we have a continuum sources, they would emit radiation that changes in intensity only slowly as a function of wavelength. Okay? So if you have a continuum sources, usually they're useful in absorption, fluorescence. Okay? Uh, another way of saying a continuum sources is what? Can we say these continuous sources emit a radiation across a broad range of wavelength? That's why we call them usually what? A broadband? Because they're, they are across a broad range of wavelength without discrete spectral line. Talagang continuous siya. Okay? So the emitted radiation forms a continuous spectrum. So if we're going to look at the characteristics of these continuous uh, sources, they emit radiation across a wide range of frequencies or wavelengths. The spectral distribution follows a smooth, continuous curve without distinctive or gaps. So diretso lang. Okay? So example... So this we could say are what? Black body radiator, incandescent bulb, thermal emitter, synchrotron radiation, ano pa? Sun. <laughs> so this is an example of a deuterium lump. Now, line sources, on the other hand, okay, these are sources that emit a few discrete lines, and it's fine used in atomic absorption spectroscopy, atomic molecular fluorescence spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy. So they are really what? Discrete lines. 
they emit radiation predominantly predominantly at a specific discrete wavelength producing spectral uh, lines or bands in their specific spectra so here that's for the aluminum that's aluminum there's magnesium okay and other stuff so they emit radiation at a specific wavelength And it would correspond to electronic or molecular transition. So spectral distribution uh, consists of distinct pits or lines separated by gaps where little to no radiation is emitted. So if you're going to, to, to look at this, uh, what we call line sources, uh, I think the common one that you can look at here is the mercury lamp. Okay, uh, the sodium vapor lamps, so they provide a relatively few sharp lines in the UV and visible region. The hollow cathode lamp, the electrodeless uh, discharge lamp, these are the most common line sources for AAS and uh, fluorescence method. But I think what is a, a classic example of a line source? This is uh, 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 the spectrum for a dual uh, hollow cathode lamp, the so-called HCL by my student here. But what's the classic line source? Usually we have the so-called laser. So continuous versus line. And we're going to talk about laser. So my question, anyone has experience using laser aside from the laser pointer? <laughs> Naka experience na kayo? Or Let's say you have a laser pointer. I know you use for color, no laser pointer nyo. I think dalawa lang eh, di ba? I know you use for laser nyo. Laser color. Oh, let me let me let me. Anyone? Wala kayong laser pointer? <laughs> so either you have what? A green or a red. So which one is more energetic between the two? Anyone? Okay. Type nung up. Which is more energetic? The red laser or the green laser? Anyone? Is it the red or the green? So usually it is the green. The green is the one that is more energetic. Okay? So if we're going to look at the laser, the term for that is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So laser is just an acronym for what we call light stimulated, uh, light amplification by stimulated emission radiation. So the first laser was described in 1960. So laser are highly useful sources in analytical instrumentation because of their high intensities, narrow bandwidth, and the coherent 
nature of the output. Okay. Now, when we're talking about high intensity, it's talking about power. They're more powerful than the typical light source. I, I remember when we we're playing laser in the lab. It can burn a, a paper. So we're trying to play it with the mirrors. That we have. Okay. And sometimes I think uh, there are scattered laser out of nowhere. And then we're wondering, why is this wall has a black spot? And then we said, oh my God, somebody used a laser and it was not focused. So there are some scattered la laser that uh, was not reflect reflected uh, the right way. So some of them went to the wall. Okay. Although this is not the same as the what the laser gun that they usually describe in sci-fi movie, I, I don't think that uh, uh, really exists. Okay, so they are usually used in high resolution spectroscopy. Okay, meron bang may laser system dyan sa Pilipinas? Rodel sa MSU meron bang may laser doon? Anyone use laser? Wala. Parang wala akong alam eh. Because it's hard to maintain them. Just to, uh, unfortunately, siguro uh, this weekend, I'm going to show you the laser system that we have at your college. Uh, when you run it, you need to have like a water system that runs with it. Kasi masyadong mataas yung energy na kailangan. So, ayaw namin uminit yung system. So, that's just like a cooling thing that we need. Okay? But, it is really useful. Okay? It has a lot of application since it was discovered in the 1960s. Okay? So, you use it to probe and monitor uh, ultra-fast phenomena, detection... They use it in the what we call the, the determination of the uh, trace element in Martian uh, soil sample. Okay, and if you want to determine, let's say, fluorescent material in forensic science, and the typical light source cannot use it, you use this what we call laser source. Okay. They have become, we could say, important in several routines. We use it usually in what? Raman spectroscopy. M most likely, yeah. I think that the terahertz is also a laser. But the thing is, you have to be very careful because if you remember, we burn. <laughs> We're using it in the Raman and then a colleague of mine gave me an example. So whenever I run it, uh, I, I told my colleague, oh, first run is so high like this and all of a sudden like that. And when I look at the microscope, because it is a microscope uh, portion, I, I could see a black dot. So that means it burns the sample. <laughs> so my colleague is an inorganic chemist. So he's trying to synthesize some crystals. And he asked me, to characterize it, to see the binding, because uh, Raman is what? Uh, poor man's uh, NMR. <laughs> so we use, uh, we have a, we could say, different uh, source of laser uh, as to what we call the other lab. And sometimes it depends on what we call the source that we look. So th th there are several lines that we usually use. Okay? Now, if you're going to look at the components of laser, so this one shows the schematic diagram. Okay, it shows the component of a typical laser source. And if you're going to look at it, you have what? The lacing medium, the pumping source, and 
the mirror. So you have the lacing medium, which is this one. So you have the pumping source, and then a lot of what we call mirrors. But mirrors usually that's when the laser goes out. Okay. So if you're going to look at what's happening here in this laser, so the heart of the device that is usually your lacing medium. So this is we could say the heart of the device. And usually it is what? What do you think that's a uh, heart of the device? It's a solid crystal. Now this crystal can be ruby. You know what a ruby is? Okay. It can be a semiconductor like a gallium arsenide. It can be a solution of organic dye, or that's the, that's the messy one, or it could be a gas, like argon or krypton. This is arsenide, arsenide. So those are, we could say, some of the materials that we use as a laser source. So the lacing material is often uh, activated or pumped okay, by radiation from an external source so that a few photons of proper energy will trigger the formation of a cascade of photons of the same energy. And usually this pumping can also be accomplished by an electrical current or an electrical discharge. So this is the thing, the power system that you have there it's really high amount to the point that and the towel don't metal coming additional transformer okay that we only turn on when we use the laser so usually there's a sequence of the things that we have so we turn it on and then we turn the water system okay so usually your power supply and you make pump thing now in my small we could say raman so usually parang meron kaming susi. So if you turn on namin yun, tapos siya yung mag-aano nung laser. But the, the, the laser that we have there is just a small one, like the one that comes from optic fiber. But if you're going to look at the system, okay, uh, you're going to have really high amount of the power supply. I, I try to be you when I go to the, to the club on the weekend. Okay? So pumping can be accomplished by the electrical current or an electrical discharge. The gas lasers usually uh, they do not have external radiation source. Instead, they have a power supply that's connected to a pair electrodes contained in a cell field with the gas. So the one that we use is an argon laser in the lab. Okay. So. The laser would function usually as an oscillator or a resonator. Uh, in a sense that the radiation produced by the lacing action is caused to pass back and forth through the medium uh, numerous times by means of a pair of the scissors as shown here. Okay, so parang nag ano, kita niyo ito, yeah, tapos babalik. So parang pinapalakas nila yung ano nila, yung uh, source nila by resonating. Okay, then uh, through the mirror. Okay, so additional photons are generated with each process leading to this enormous amplification. Remember, light amplification. So the way that it looks at here, so there's a light coming from here. So what does it do? Okay, when it goes there, okay, the mirror can reflect them back okay, until they develop enough power and then you have the so-called laser beam.
So this repeated passage also produced a beam that is highly parallel because non-parallel radiation escapes from the side of the medium being reflected a few times. And one of the easiest way to obtain a usable laser beam is to cut, uh, to coat one of the mirrors with sufficiently thin layer of reflecting material so that a fraction of the beam is transmitted rather than reflected. Okay. Uh, based on my experience, okay, they have become important part for use in the visible region, but they also use it in the UV. But what's the problem if you have a laser in the UV region? Anyone? I was not, I have limited uh, what people experience using the UV because the UV laser came when I'm all, all already almost full time. The UV laser came when Marvin came to the lab. Jason and I are just already going out. It, it's very hard because hindi mo siya nakikita eh. So the way we adjust it is we look at this, what we call the signal coming from the standards that we put there. Okay. So most of them are, we could say, monochromatic. They are really monochromatic and they are highly what we call the coherent radiation. Anyone know what the coherent radiation means? One company of laser is e even named coherent. What does the coherent radiation mean? So usually coherent, okay? Uh, they exhibit a specific phase relationship over a certain spatial or temporal extent. So when you have what we call the coherent radiation, one property that it has is the so-called monochromaticity. Okay. So that's, uh, I, I know one of the company that the name that they have is laser. So now the question is how you're going to what we call induce the lacing mechanism. How do we do this lacing mechanism? So they said there are what? Four processes. We have the pumping, spontaneous emission. So you have the spontaneous emission, okay? Stimulated emission and absorption. So all of them are what? the one that is described by Einstein earlier in our discussion. So when we have this, what we call pumping, okay? So what we do here, the molecules of the active medium are excited to higher energy level. Okay? So if you're going to look at this, what we call pumping, which is necessary uh, for laser action, this is the process for which uh, the active species of a laser is excited by means of an electrical discharge, passage of an electrical current, or exposure to an intense radiant source. So if you're going to see what's happening during pumping, you can look at this thing. Okay? You can excite it by electrical, radiant, or chemical energy. So you just what we call introduce an energy there to excite the atom that you have there, okay? So it could lead to partial re relaxation or metastable excited state, okay? So uh, uh, during the pumping uh, in a molecular system, several of the higher electronic and vibrational energy levels of the active species are populated because they go up to the higher energy and vibrational uh, uh, level, okay? Electronic and vibrational energy level. So as you could see here, okay? So one electron is excited to this energy level, one electron is excited to this, what we call the energy level. Now, in the partial uh, relaxation, okay. 
what, what what's the difference we could say with this uh, two? What's the difference of this compared to this one? Anyone? Any difference on the lower? So one has a slightly higher vibrational level. Okay. And if you're going to look at this, that could give you a different lifetime. Okay. So some excited electronic states of the laser material, they have li lifetimes considerably longer, usually one uh, milliseconds or more than their excited vibrational counterparts. So these long-lived states are those so-called the metastable states. So that is what we call the pumping. Now, how about the next one? So this is what we say the pumping that we have. So the next one, in, uh, is spontaneous emission. So in a spontaneous emission, a molecule in an excited state can lose excess energy by emitting a photon. So this is, we could say, fluorescence. Okay, so if you're going to look at the figure that we have here, so we have a species in an excited state due to pumping, okay, they may lose all or part of the energy that they have there, okay? So a species in an excited electronic state, they may lose all part of its excess energy by spontaneous emission uh of radiation so you can see it depicted here in this what we call three diagram so it could be in this way it could be on this way or it could be on that way so what's the difference of these things here and the difference is a couple of so this one, okay, this one. So dito na pumapasok yung coherent and incoherent stuff. So if you're going to look at what's happening here, so the energy of the fluorescence is less than the energy of the absorption. And this leads to a wavelength of the fluorescence being what? Longer than the wavelength of the absorption. So the fluorescence light is at longer wavelength than the excitation light. So you excite them at shorter wavelength because that has higher energy. And you observe the emission at longer wavelength because they have lower energy okay so if you're going to look at this one so this one we could say still coherent but this one this is incoherent because they have different phase position the same thing as this what we call the other one now we could say the spontaneous emission yields incoherent monochromatic radiation Okay, so it's important to note that at the instance at which emission occurs and the part of the resulting photon, they vary from excited molecules to excited molecules because of this spontaneous emission. Okay, so we could say spontaneous emission is a random process. Now, how about the next one? The next one is the stimulated emission. Okay. So what happens in this what we call uh, stimulated emission? How is it different from uh, this what we call spontaneous? 
emission. Okay, so, so maybe the way that we can look at it is here. Now between the two, this is the one that results for laser. Remember the name, a light amplification by stimulated uh, emission radiation, right? That's the meaning of what we call laser. So you have to have a simulated emission to have this what we call lacing. So what happened here? So again, nandong pa rin sa excited state, the excited molecules interact with photons that have precisely the same energy produced by the spontaneous emission. Now, this collision causes the excited molecules to relax and emit a photon, which is the emission. And the photon energy of this emission is equal to the photon energy of the collision photon, where there are now two photons with the same energy and same phase and same direction, making them coherent. To so see the difference of this stimulated and spontaneous one. Okay. So they should be precisely of the same direction and the same phase. So stimulated emission, we could say, is totally coherent with the incoming radiation, unlike the uh, spontaneous emission. Okay. Now we could say the stimulated emission, that's the one that plays a critical role in the amplification of light within the laser medium. So as the photon pass through the medium, they stimulate the other excited atoms or molecules to emit additional photons of the same frequency and phase leading to the amplification of the signal or the light signal. And this brings us to the last one, which is what we call absorption. So absorption process usually competes with the stimulated emission. So here you have two photons uh, of energy, okay? That is exactly equal to the difference between what? EX and EY. Okay. And what happened here, they are absorbed to produce the metastable excited state. It's shown here. The metastable excited state. So a molecule in the ground state absorbed photons promoted to the excited state. Now, same energy level as pumping, but now the photons that were produced for lacing are what we call gone. Okay. You know that the metastable excited state, they are what? Identical okay, to that attained by the pumping. So those are, we could say, the four process that you need to uh, have this lacing mechanism. But <laughs> okay. It will undergo in this so called the uh, population inversion and light amplification. So, to have light amplification in laser, your number of photons produced by stimulated emission must exceed the number that is lost by absorption. So, how can you do that? Okay. So you can only have this condition when the number of your particles in the higher energy states exceeds in the number in the lower energy states. In other words, you have the so-called population inversion. Okay, so you have to make sure that the number in the excited state 
that the population there is much higher than the one in the lower state. So there must be a population inversion to sustain lacing. The population of the molecules is inverted relative to how the population normally exists. Because what's the normal population? There are more population in the lower energy level compared to the higher energy level. But for the laser or lacing to continue, you have to have a popular inversion. You invert the population. Mas marami siya excited state kaysa doon sa ground state. So there, uh, normally there are more molecules in the ground state than in the excited state. More, more than 50%. So more molecules in the excited state than in the ground state. Okay? Now, why is it important? Well, if you have more molecules in the ground state, that leads to more molecules that can absorb photons. Now remember, your absorption competes with your stimulated emission. Okay, and in this case, light is attenuated rather than amplified. So if you have more molecules in the excited state, you have a net gain in the photons that is produced. So if you're going to look at this one here, okay, so if you have absorption, in this case, what happens? It goes to higher energy. After that, it can produce a stimulated emission, and there's what? Light attenuation by absorption. But if you have a stimulated emission, okay, it leads to absorption, and it would produce light amplification by stimulated emission. So the passage that you can have here, an, in, an uninverted population, so this is the normal one, okay, and one that has this what we call inverted population. So that's the one that you have for you to have a system that is known as the laser. Now the question is, how do you achieve this? How do you achieve population inversion? So the way to do it is you have what? A laser system that we could say a three level system, okay? Or a four level system. So that's usually what the laser system do. So in a three level uh, system, the transition, okay? Uh, of course, four level is better. It's easier to sustain population uh, inversion. So three level uh, system, the lacing transition is between the excited state and the ground state. So if you have what we call the three level system, what happened here, the transition responsible for laser radiation is between an excited state and the ground state. In a four our level system, on the other hand, the radiation is generated by a transition from okay, E to the Y, okay, and then E to the X, and what else in addition to E to the X? E to the Y, uh, E to the X, okay, that is a greater uh, energy than the ground state. So furthermore, it's necessary to that the transition from the E to the X and the ground state to be rapid. Now, the main advantage of laser uh, for laser system, laser level system, is that the population inversions uh, essential for laser action are achieved more easily compared to a three level. Okay, so so this is because all you need is to have more more molecules in the EY. Okay, for the population inversion for the what we call four levels. So it's easier to achieve that more molecules in EY than the ground state that has the three level system. Now, if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call two system that we have here, At room temperature, usually a large majority of the laser species, they will be in ground state level in both systems. Now, suppose, uh, sufficient energy must be provided to convert them 
uh, more than 50% of the lacing species would be a higher energy level of a three-level system. In a four-level system, it's only necessary to pump sufficiently to make the number of the particles in the energy Y level exceed the number in the energy level X. Okay. And the lifetime of a particle in the E to the E X state is brief. However, because the transition to E zero is fast, the number of the E X state is generally negligible relative to the number that has energy to the zero and also with respect to the number in the E1. So for energy level, they achieve a population inversion uh, with a small expenditure of pumping energy. Now what are, we could say, example of the laser. So we have this what we call solid state laser. So in, in the solid state laser, you have this NDYAG. And th that's the one that is what we call common. So if you're going to have NDAYG, uh, what do you think the name of that? What is ND? Anong metal yung, uh, anong element yung ND? Uh, my note says is what, neodymium? Or ne neodymium? I never, uh, I cannot really use. And then wider is what? Yttrium, yttrium aluminum garnet. So NDYAG stands for neodymium dop yttrium aluminum garnet. So this is the most common, uh, the most widely used solid state laser. So the lacing is consists of neodymium ion in a host crystals of ethereum aluminum garnet. So this system offers the advantage of being a four level laser, which makes it much easier to achieve population inversion than the one that used ruby, or what we call a ruby. So the first successful laser that they did in 1960, they used a three level device wherein they use a ruby crystal as the active medium. So what is ruby made up of? Anyone? Ano yung composition ng ruby? It's made up of aluminum oxide. Now, you also have, I, I think, I experience using uh, what we call titanium sapphire when I was in grad school. I think that's the one that we have. Tawag namin doon yan, Mira system. <laughs> I'm still laughing a bit kasi I, I messed up uh, one part of the optical instrument with the laser. Sinunog ko yung detector. So the, uh, the the titanium sapphire is an important laser in spectroscopy because its wavelength is continuously tunable in the red and the laser uh, region. But you can produce okay, a tunable output in the visible and the UV regions because usually what happens, let's say, if, if you want to, uh, if you have a line at uh, around 800, so you tune it, you can produce divided by 800, a line at 400, okay? 800 divided by 3, you can produce a line that is there. Okay, kinutun lang namin. Okay? So that, that's another, we could say, example of this uh, solid uh, state laser. Optical 
laser is the one that is really being used, the optical fiber laser. So usually what they have is they have this rare air element, erbium, yttrium, tulium. Okay. So the fiber can be directly from, from the end site with the semiconductor diode uh, laser. Now, there are many different, we could say, gas lasers. So the one that I usually has experience use is the one that we have in York, the argon lump. Okay. So these are the one that contains uh, the so-called uh, gas laser. So we have an argon 488 and an argon 515 in the lab. Okay. So usually this uh, gas laser, there are excimer lasers that contain the mixture of this. So what uh, they usually use the argon uh, ion laser, it produces intense lines in 514 and 488. So usually we use it for some protein samples. Okay. It's a four-level device in which the argon ions are formed by an electrical or radio frequency discharge. So this is usually used in fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy. We also uh, have nitrogen laser pumped with a high voltage part uh, that provides a momentary pulse of current. Okay. And then we have the dye laser. So that's the, uh, we tried to do that, that it got messy. So we use organic dye there, and then we put tunable output. Okay, uh, mostly this organic, uh, this organic dye or dye laser, they're import concentration sources in analytical chemistry because you can tune them over a range of 20 to 50 nanometer in the visible region. So if you say tunable, you can change the wavelength, okay? Uh, you can go to the wavelength that you need in this what we call the dye laser. There are other uh, what we call types of laser. You have this metal vapor laser, semiconductor laser, but we just use the one, uh, the one that is what we call the commonly used. So I'm hoping that you're going to experience how to use this laser. It's really a very good, we could say, experience doing that. I have fun. I, I think I have some uh, photos that uh, I, what we call, put before. <laughs> and you will know if, if you use laser, you said, oh, but you out of face yung laser mo. I use it when you, ano, merong mga scattered light na makikita. Okay. So I'll end here. And uh, as I've told you earlier, konti lang umaten sa inyo, mostly, most of you are just looking at the recording. So, I look at the notes, the way I, I, I force students to read the book is to give a quiz directly to on the book, aside from the one that we give here, okay? So there's a quiz, the one that I have here. So what I do is I supplement uh, the book, because the book is from 1988. Some of you may not be existing during that time. But as I told you, this is the Bible of spectrochemical methods. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you the update that you have. So there's another way of the of how they discuss this later in the book. So I, I use the one that is a modern one, but I really want you to learn the book. That that's the only way for, for you to learn is to, to force you to read it. So maybe the quiz that we have is based on the what we could book. Okay. Now uh on Friday I think uh, you, uh, I don't know. Uh, there is an event in the IC 